Hello, everyone. I'm here with Rosie Kay. It is an absolutely fascinating story. She's going to uh, tell us uh, her story in conversations with Peter Bogosian. We're in London on Turf Island, and we were just talking about she has some tea, some genuine, authentic tea, not made in the microwave. I'm learning the customs of your people and trying <laughs> to honor those. Um, all right, Reed, let's start with a video. We're going to do a video of Rosie's dance company, correct? Uh, it's a piece called MK Ultra, and it premiered in 2017, and it's about conspiracy theory, pop stars, and CIA brainwashing. Excellent. We're going to be talking about the arts today, which is very exciting. Cool. The image of the human being that was being built up at that particular time was that there was a great deal of vulnerability in every human being and that that vulnerability could be manipulated to program somebody to be something like the head that of I wanted CIA them to be. Psychology talking about and they how didn't want to be. Brains, you know, in the 50s at this point. That you could manipulate people like Disney in such a way Disney's that they pop stars could be to become automatons, kind of if you will, or whatever your own purpose like That's a conspiracy were. theory. This was the image I'm just that telling Peter was say, possible. Yeah. So... And you helped design this choreography? Human figures, dimensional human figures move, make animals move, make anything move, through the use of electronics, the, the tape mechanism. That uh, the tape, yeah, I'm looking at some of the programming that seems like it's too laggy, the video. This was to the moon thing. Different right, let's just stages, kill the video since the whole framework. Uh, so That's your story program. is Eight absolutely terms. fascinating. Oh. All right, so your story is absolutely fascinating. The first time I heard it, I was flabbergasted by it. Even I, who hear it, hears a, a ton of crazy stuff on a daily basis, even I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. Um, tell us about it. Well, I suppose I, I've always been kind of attracted to interesting and controversial subject matters. And I've kind of really always enjoyed the fact that dance does it in quite a difficult way. Like you can get away with stuff in dance because I'm not pointing the finger and I'm not kind of saying, this is what I want you to think about war. This is what I want you to think about religion. So in the build up to this period, I just made a trilogy of works. That and, was, and you're, you're the, the contextualize this, you're a dancer. I, I trained as a dancer and a, as a choreographer. I spent six years, uh, mostly abroad, dancing in Poland, France, Germany and the US. And I always knew I wanted to be a choreographer. I was much more concerned with what the dance was saying. Mm. Um, so I returned back to the UK 20 years ago. And that's when I saw, well, I came back to the UK for personal reasons, but also because I saw that there was a lot of funding going into the arts. Uh, it was the Blair government at the time. There was a lot of investment in the arts. And I ended up in Birmingham. There were some beautiful dance studios. And I decided to stay put in Birmingham and, you know, commit to this really, this dream of being a choreographer. So I set up a company 20 years ago called Rosie K Dance Company. And I built it up from solo duet work uh some of it looking at subject matter some of it more abstract right up to being where i was two years ago regularly funded uh kind of full-time people working for the company quite you know dancing at some of the best theaters in the uk europe and america actually as well so 
you have to excuse me because I know virtually nothing about dance. <laughs> so, what are you training like? Like, t- t- how many hours a day are you training? What when you're a student or when you're a professional? Well, when you're a student and and then and then like you personally, how many hours a day did you train? So, so I went to dance school back in the conservatoire days where if you were good enough to get in, you got your fees paid. So it was like a really rigorous, long uh, audition process. But once you got in, everybody was kind of equal. Um, and there was people from like a whole bunch of different backgrounds, but like the most talented people. Like and we f- would train, five hours a day? Oh, more than that. I mean, wow. you'd have four hours of technique a day before lunch. And then you'd have choreography, choreology, music, drama, singing, all sorts of stuff as well in the after, like like contextual studies. So, and then you'd have rehearsals in the evening. So sometimes you'd be, I'd be getting into college at 8 a.m., doing a warm up for an hour, dancing for four hours, and then rehearsing right up till eight, 10 o'clock at night. So it's long, long days, totally different to any other student of my friends that went to do normal degrees. If, if you don't mind me asking, were you, what were you eating? Were, was it, were you just eating anything? Did they have dietary advice for you or two? Or? So in the 90s, it was the kind of like change from um, sort of the stereotypical one Malteser a day or eating toilet paper. We were trying to break out of that really skinny aesthetic. And yeah. it was much more, if you think of like the 90s and the even in fashion, there was that kind of athletic female strong supermodel so we were all really into like sports nutrition and dance nutrition um I actually got glandular fever during my training so I got really into fitness and gym good nutrition diet and so I never went for that kind of sort of ideal I went for a really aesthetic sort of female dancer if you could only choose one would you choose to be a good dancer and a mediocre athlete or a good athlete and a mediocre dancer they're totally different things. You you have to train and behave like an athlete to a certain extent, but you're not in it, or you I wasn't in it for the competition. So you're not trying to win anything. Now there are dance competitions and I did do them when I was like a kid, but you're also an artist. So there's this other side of you that's much more like a an actor or a jazz musician. You You want to experiment, you want to find out who you are, you want to like test the boundaries of what your art form is. There's something like, much more rebellious about you as well. So there's a really difficult balance when you're in a very physical art form. So I've always had to balance between the discipline of being a dancer and then the kind of wildness and freedom of wanting to be an artist that speaks about the world we live in. So which would you rather be? The artist. But then I'm no artist if I'm ill and I'm no dancer if I'm not disciplined. So it's just a balance. I would imagine to rise to an elite level of dancer, you'd need discipline. Yes. Would it be fair to say that you need grit? Yes. I think for me, it's always come down to joy. Like I just love it. It takes you to places both yourself when you're dancing. It takes you to places that I'd say kind of spiritual, Um, but they're also like, they help for me it helps me understand myself and the world I live in and it's the only way I can do that properly um but then also when you create a dance when you see other people living and embodying it that's really incredible and then when you sit in an auditorium and those people are embodying it and you feel these like thousand other people watching that work there's yet another experience of sharing something, communicating something. And 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 dance is so different to theater because you have to use a different bit of your brain to even just understand it. So I completely see that, even though I know nothing about that. Like I completely, I grok that. So my question is, of all the things you could have pursued for, would it be fair to say, tens of thousands of hours? Is that fair to say? Yeah. 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 Of all the things you could have pursued, of all the types of physical excellence, why did you choose that dance? Well, the, the family legend is that I danced before I could talk. So there was something in me that that it was like a dancing spirit, really. Um, and then I kind of, I just got through it with the kind of like mentality that it's so impossible. It'll never happen. So I may as well give it everything anyway. 
<laughs> because it's so competitive. It's such a nightmare. It's such a hideous profession. It's so tough. It's so painful. But I was like, well, I may as well give it everything and just see what happens. And amazingly, that took me quite far. And every time I thought or wanted to or felt like I was about to give up, I would just take it back down to sort of ground zero and go, well, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be a success. Let's just see if you can carry on for another year. Yeah. I, so I would imagine it's the same in any elite physical activity, the same kind of perseverance, discipline. But why dance? I mean, why, why not jujitsu? Why not mountain climbing or free climbing? Why not? So you have, you have a historical art form that has a great, huge, long legacy. I mean, it, you can go back to anthropology and say that it's one of the sort of primordial sort of forms of communication. You know, it, maybe it goes before speech, maybe it goes sort of alongside music, but you've also got a really sort of serious technical side to it. So sort of from ballet onwards and how dance has been used to explicitly or inexplicitly tell things about the world we live in. When I discovered contemporary dance, which is what I do, I suppose like dance theatre or yeah. modern dance, for me, what blew my mind was it combined dance, the kind of physicality, it combined music, you can use any type of music, yeah, music yeah. it combines theatre, you can sing, act, dance, and it combined politics. You could, the, my real heroines of the kind of like turn of the century, they were pioneers just for being women on stage dancing the way they wanted to dance, like Isadora Duncan, Martha Graham. These were women that simply by having the kind of grace and power and discipline to do that, they it, it blew people's minds. Did, interesting. Did being a woman have anything to do with you? Like it's a, counterfactual, probably impossible. But if you th if you were born into a man's body, do you think you would have had the same passion for dance? So this is. Slight sort of sad bit of my family story in which my brother died in between me and my sister. And so when I was young, I kind of wanted to fulfill a little bit both the girl role and the boy role. I don't know why. I think it was like, I don't know how embedded these sex stereotypes are, but it was something I'd thought about. Like I loved steam trains. I loved my ballet and my dancing, but I was also in the football team until at 12, they kicked me out. And I was like, but why? I'm the best because I was a girl. And I was like, but I'm your best striker. And they were like, yeah, but you're a girl, get out, get out. And of course, at that age, it does start to get so, dangerous. So much for the meritocracy, right? Well, I mean, I mean, now you look at women's sports, you go, well, actually, there is a transformation that happens in puberty. And maybe it's much safer for sex, uh, sex segregated sports. But I felt, it was, you know, there was no women's football, but there was still dance. And so I think some ways dance for me was rebelling against the female stereotype, actually. Um, so just if you don't mind just engaging me in a hypothetical because i'm i'm fascinated by your passion for and love of dance so let's say that you could rewind the tape and one of the things to, to go back to your early life but the total number of hours on the tape remain the same so you 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 could take the total number of hours that you've dedicated to dance in every capacity and you rewind the tape until you were five. But when did you start dancing? Three. Oh, holy <laughs> Lord. Okay. So you rewind the tape until you were three, and you, you would get to either play the tape again in terms of you would get to devote those hours to dance, or you could devote those hours to pursuing another physical excellence. What would you do? Dance, of course. Because, because it's, I mean, the only thing that would possibly maybe tempt me would be maybe painting or art. And, and, and there's something, I suppose, a little bit of me hankers after that because it would just be me alone with my paints. The complicated thing with dance is you're always with other people or you're often like you're taught by, it's very pedagogic, you're taught by other people, you're in classes with other people. I mean, right. I really came into my own when I started to make my own solos and make my own work and dancing alone. I think that's where I really discovered that I could say what I wanted to say much better through dance than through language. So two two questions, totally unrelated. Are you, do you become friends with the people you're dancing with? I certainly did. Yes, yes. How is it possible for someone to differentiate good from bad choreography? Well, do you know it's really? I've got a funny story about that because um, I was working for a choreographer who I absolutely adored, and I just thought she was the best thing ever. And I worked so hard, and I got onto stage, and it was the premiere. And as I was dancing, I realised. 
this was a terrible piece of work. <laughs> and I realized that I, as a dancer, couldn't tell. I've also worked with people that I thought were terrible choreographers, but I look back and they were fantastic. And I just, I was too immature to understand what was going on. There is a, there is a gap between you, the instrument, the dancer, and what the choreographer is actually producing. So, so you mean, so there is a way to tell, but you have to be trained in the tools to be able to tell what is good. So you're, you're different things. So, so when you're a dancer, you really are truly the instrument and you actually, it was only as I, when I became a choreographer and I matured, I became a much better dancer because it was just like, you ask me what to do, I'll do it and I'll give you everything and I won't judge it. Okay. When you're younger, you think, oh, I don't know if I like this choreographer or not. Only as you get older, you realize there is a different, it's like, I am the paint and you're the painter. So okay. let me get on with it. So I'm going to ask you one more question, then I want to get into your absolutely fascinating story. Let's say, so I think it's fairly safe to say that if others looked at your life, they would say, wow, this person's devoted themselves to dance. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Let's say that there was, by all intents and purposes, somebody who was a crappy choreographer and they put on a performance or they choreographed a, a rather elaborate performance and the critics thought it was terrible, but the audience loved it and gave them a standing ovation. Would you question, what, what would that cause you to do? What would that cause you to think? Well, it just happens recently because... Um... There's this thing post COVID where even if, if a show does get put on, it seems to have like a standing ovation, no matter what the quality is. And I actually was in the audience and I thought, I don't want to stand up because I don't feel it deserves it. But the peer pressure was so strong that I ended up standing up. I think it's really, oh. it's really strange. It's, it's, it's a really odd one because there is, it's, a, it's like well, what, what we're living in is the madness of crowds. And I've always thought that theater was a really safe place really safe and you can decide you sit in the dark on your own and you each one of us in that auditorium experience the art ourselves uh, it's a private affair to some mm. extent but then this whole mass thing I, right. I i think we're in a funny time the theater has changed the theater has changed so this is a perfect segue into your story tell us about your story please so i was Towards the end of making a big, large-scale production of Romeo and Juliet, I'd been working on it for over five years, researching, embedding with police and gangs, looking at knife crime, looking at uh, religious differences in the city that I live in, Birmingham, which is a very diverse city. And I was adapting Romeo and Juliet to Birmingham in the 21st century. So I was right at the end. I was like 10 days away from the premiere. I had a cast of nine dancers. And the atmosphere was strange. It was odd. It was. And looking back now, there were reasons for that. But at the time, I thought it was just COVID and masks and the fact that we couldn't socialize like normal. So I invited them to my house. We had a dinner. Um, I showed them around my home. They played with my son in the garden, who was little. Uh, they drank lots and lots of booze. And then after midnight, I think it was about half 12, um, we started discussing my next show, which was an adaptation of Virginia Woolf's Orlando. And in the book, which is wonderful, and this fantastic tour de force, I love Virginia Woolf's, that's such a funny, clever book. The hero turns into a heroine. So Orlando goes from being male to female. And it launched very quickly into an argument about that should be played by a trans dancer. And I said, not, but then quite quickly, it got into a really serious heated argument about uh, sex and gender and the reality of sex. And I was quite vigorously defending women's rights and pointing out some of the worst case scenarios. So, so let, let me, so they thought that a trans person should play what a trans character, but it's not really a trans character. But... No. And, and for me, I don't know. I, I I am genuinely, totally, still totally open about who could play Orlando. It would just need to be somebody that was absolutely phenomenal, a phenomenal dancer and understood different ways of physicality, I suppose. But I mean, if if isn't that the whole idea of what acting is? I mean, if that were the case, you could never have science fiction. You could never have fantasy. You could never, well, I suppose you could have horror. But I mean, you don't think... 
if you take out the identity level salience, you don't think, well, we need a person who's been tortured to play a torture victim. But also there's something just like about dance. Like we are using our bodies. Our bodies are our bodies. That's just a fact. I don't see anything. Now, how you think of your body or who you think of your body, fine, no problem. But when you come to the studio and you work, we're working with physicality, technique, meaning it's it's a body. And I'm cool with that. I, I guess, I don't, I, I don't know, just perhaps it's an unfair question, but nobody says in Star Trek that we need actual Klingons to play <laughs> Klingons, right? I mean, nobody, nobody said, so I, I'm just, okay, so all right, so keep, keep going on with your story yes, then. Yes, but I, but I was entering in, I was sort of tiptoeing into a territory that I knew was controversial and and I'd watched and seen what was going on around so what year was this so this was 2021 but I'd been aware of what was happening in the women's movement since 2018 I'd been watching it and following it on Twitter and sort of becoming more and more I mean I was never um I was never closed about my views I was very open about that I thought this was a threat to women's rights and that if we just declared that anybody could be a woman then we were going to have problems defending women's rights in law, in prisons, and in all these extreme positions. And that, I thought, was a fairly sensible, straightforward well, it is. opinion. I think yeah. it is too. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so I was sort of defending that viewpoint. Anyway, it, it got really nasty to the point where I was sort of re telling them about how I, I nearly died in childbirth with my son oh, and sorry. that that was a very uniquely female experience. And, and and that you must know, I think the worst thing that I said was that you must know if you have a vagina or a penis. And that was like, <gasps> beyond the pale. And I knew the because next- Because they don't know if they have a vagina or a I penis. Don't, I don't know that, you, like, I didn't understand that that was some sort of crime. And and I think there's a lot of play acting about this. Of course. I, I think they play I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing for sure, who knows what a woman is, Hamas. Quite. They know what a woman. They know exactly what a woman is. Yeah. Okay. So it's the Taliban. The Taliban. There's no question about it. So maybe in the next Supreme Court hearing, if they're asked what a woman is, we'll find someone from Hamas to consult them. Okay. So t tell me then. You. Okay. So. So I. I'm hesitant to ask this question. I'm going to ask. Are you a, like a Tory or a conservative? No, not at all. No. Um, I'm sort of a lefty artist, but I'd probably put myself as, as a old fashioned liberal. Okay. Okay. So were they accusing you of being like a Nazi or a fascist or a Tory or a conservative or, or were they just like, what was the real, and who are these people? Like, these are your fellow friends and your dancers. Yeah. And some dancers I'd actually known since they were quite young, I'd sort of mentored and taught and used to uh, put them in sort of, children's pieces and things like I, I, I did feel like I was in trusted company. Um, but yes, they were working for me and some of them were quite young and inexperienced, but it felt like they'd got a gotcha on me and they were going to use it. And then they kind of escalated that to the board. I felt really scared. And Which fun. board? So, so this is a little bit boring, but a couple of years previously, I'd shifted the company from being a director uh, okay. to becoming a charity. And under okay. charitable law, I couldn't stay being a director. So I became okay. an employee. So I had a board of trustees. Okay. And so did they turn on you? Yes. Completely turn on me. Yeah. Yeah. And that was for me the biggest betrayal because that's the people that I thought should be out there to have my back. Okay. So, so, okay. So then what happened? Um, I went through one investigation that took sort of six to eight weeks. Um, I found out that the board was soliciting complaints from the dancers, offering to pay them for complaints against me, uh, thanking them. What type of complaints? Uh, so, so a few complaints came in. Some of them were written. Some of them were verbal that had to be that were recorded and had to be transcribed. I was allowed about to this trans thing um, about this dinner party, yeah, and what I said at this dinner. But it party. wasn't anything else. It wasn't like nope. you're extorting money. No, no, no. Yeah. It was literally just that 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 I had, that they were upset about what I'd said. 
And there was this kind of idea that I was a, uh, I was out of date and uneducated. And, and the, the correct education would be to use a critical lens and think that sex is a matter of self-identification. Is that? Yes. Yes. I mean, the, it's, it was weird. There wasn't really an argument there. And I kept trying to explain that when they use the word transphobia, it's just because I believe sex is real. That in itself is the definition of transphobia. There's nothing phobic. It's literally like, I don't believe in the make-believe that so we're they, unsexed bodies. They thought gender is a social construct, sex is a social construct, or did that idea of social construct come up at all? No, I think they were sort of in, in, embodying the fact that they saw themselves as non-binaries, some of them. So gender would be unconnected from sex or disconnected from sex. Which was strange because they auditioned for sex-based roles. This was clearly an adaptation of Shakespeare. These were clearly men and women. So they were auditioned for, okay, so I'm, tr I'm just trying to process this. And their complaint, th their grievance, if you will, was that you're a bigot. What was, what was the essence of their grievance? Oh, I, th I think the essence would be that I was transphobic and in the future, a hypothetical trans person may possibly feel unsafe with me in the studio because I held these views. Could Juliet be a woman and not female? N not in my take of Shakespeare's play and not as a woman reading it and getting inside the character and then wanting to adapt that for dance. I think what's really interesting about Juliet is because she is up for it and is sexually interested in Romeo as Romeo is in, as her. And so it's it's the first time there's a real love at first sight and a real match of sex, sexual equals in their love affair. And I think that's really interesting for Shakespeare's time. And I wanted to find an equivalent for like the modern age. So, so for me, that was important that that, and also the whole stuff around the gangs, the knives, what's going on in gang culture in Birmingham that also has like, it's really specific the way that the men and the girls, the men and the women behave differently. Like that was important to the show. I, what like do I'm, you mean? I'm interested. Well, so, so when I was sort of doing all this research with the police, the way that boys are initiated into gangs um, is quite specific. And in Birmingham, they were doing this stuff where they were doing like point systems of stabbings. Yeah. So kids would come home with like knife wounds in their shoes and their blazers and kids would sometimes get stabbed near their hearts if the games went too far. Whereas the girls' initiation rights were kind of much more sort of sexually based about favors they were giving to men. And so this whole thing about like women being like genuinely sexually liberated wasn't was not true. Yeah. So if anybody's listening to this and you're a young, young person, uh, tough isn't how you act, tough isn't how many tattoos you have. As my my buddy Matt Thornton, one of the original Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts says tough is how you train so if you want to be tough go in a jiu-jitsu gym or go in an mma gym and don't tap or at least don't don't tap until don't tap from exhaustion so tough is how you tough isn't tough isn't stabbing yourself with a knife tough is having somebody on top of you trying to choke you and then not tapping at the last second okay that was just <laughs> for any young people out there okay so um so what was the upshot of all this? So the, the first investigation, I was exonerated. We did another bunch of shows. One of the dancers walked out before the big shows and then lodged an appeal. And I started to get really worried then. I said, well, hang on, this person's no longer even in employment. Uh, how come, you know, what, what bit of the disciplinary or grievance process are we in now? Like what's yeah. going on? Like explain to me. And then by accident, they sent me an email with a whole chain of like lawyers, staff and HR consultants that were part of the same law firm. So I needed to bring in my own lawyer at that point and oh. just say, wait a minute, if this is going too far, you're spending thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money to investigate the Rosie K of the Rosie K Dance Company. What's the outcome that you're looking to have? Because it's this kind of getting existential, like, I'm the Rosie K of Rosie K Dance Company. Without me, there is no company and there is no money coming in. You are trustees. 
you, you are meant to protect the charity of which the charitable aim is to make dance work that looks at controversial and difficult and taboo subject matter that was written in. So, okay, we may have a little bit of a challenging situation, but that's kind of what we're meant to do as an artistic organization. You, I really did feel it had gone into a witch hunt by that point. For sure. So, so in 2018, in the four or five years since then. Oh, it was two years ago. Oh, that was only two was years. Only oh, two the years original ago. thing was from 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So have things changed in the last two years in terms of the cultural values about con conception of trans and women here on Turf Island, as they say? Well, I would have hoped. Um, but actually... Like Tavistock, for example, has that changed anything? Well, that's or? right. So, 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 just about everything I said at that dinner party has been vindicated. It, it's all come out now. These were things that were being uh, suppressed. They were being suppressed in the mainstream press, and it's all come out. And like, wh like what? Like the Tavistock, for example, which yeah. has been closed. Um, about like kind of the rapists in women's jails. About the rape which, victims. Which, just by the way, we were assured would never happen. I was told that, that, we were, that I was told that I was bigoted for even exactly bigoted, even right. even for suggesting I th uh, the fact that female victims of rape have to call their rapist she in court, despite the fact that that goes against the definition of rape in this country. The fact that women are losing first, second, third place podium spaces in sports. The fact that women um, feel deeply uncomfortable in hospitals or changing rooms or toilets if they have just mysteriously become mixed gender overnight. So, so that's that's all the stuff I was saying. All of that stuff is out. However, I think the arts in general are still going down that direction quite strongly. The brakes have not been put on yet. Okay, before we go down the arts, I just wanna I just wanna make sure that I, I understand this. And I want to ask you if you did anybody ever tell you you're on the wrong side of history? Um, I had somebody call me um, uh, a Nazi and a fascist, and it was somebody I knew. Just one person. That's that wasn't too bad. I mean, amazing. they might. I mean, there might have been more, but I, I did go off social media for oh, a little okay, bit, that's and, and okay. that'll be why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, w in this whole process, you, I would assume, you learned who your friends were. Quite. Did anybody apologize to you? No, I was just—I shouldn't have asked that question. I was going to say, mm. I bet no one apologized no. to you, but that's what I should have said. But too late now. But did did anybody apologize to you? No, no. no. You think anybody's going to apologize to you? I think sometimes they wake up at two a.m. and feel really weird, and I think it's still—I think it's there in their subconscious. But do you think they'll apologize to you? Possibly one or two. I would be extraordinarily surprised. I mean, by the end of my life. Oh, okay, maybe. <laughs> well. <laughs> Would you get back to me and let me know if anybody apologizes? I will. To you? I will do better. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath. I I predict that one or two would be the absolute max. Yeah. I don't think they're going to apologize to you. I don't. I think because I think the kind of people is in general who have been so taken in by this ideology have a kind of psychological disorder in the first place that would that would inhibit them from apologizing. Um, what, like what, what, I, what I can't get my head around though is like how widespread this is. So, so I've now interviewed like 15 other people in the arts, artists and art yeah. leaders. And, and, and because, I mean, I always thought my case was so ridiculous and so insane and it was so hard to get my head around even what was happening to me. But a bit like you, when I hear other people's stories, yeah. I'm like, what? How? Not not just these horrible, vexatious, malicious complaints, but the, the whole way that any leadership structure and safeguarding, all these policies that were meant to be there to help people have failed utterly and are used against good people. This is such a mass. Yeah, it's an ideology, ideological-induced disorder that certain people are much more susceptible to uh, and then they find communities they can plug into of other people who are unhinged and 
and uh, they go on witch hunts, blame systems, uh, shut off in any kind of valuation of evidence or reason and think that they're a better person. Because I, th I think they so. think they're right. They yeah. think they're right. Yeah, I think they're right. I couple with that. I think that they have to be incapable of a deeper form of self-reflection because I don't think that anybody with a half a brain who reasons honestly could come to literally any of these conclusions. I mean, again, this is just monumental stupidity. <laughs> I mean, it really is true. It is unparalleled a historic stupidity. Nobody has ever thought this. I mean, and, and then I just remember just these, these drag out arguments of people assuring me, enraged at me that I would say that a man is going to be a rape, a woman in a prison. They would be just, I mean, that yeah. was, yeah. And now it happens. Yeah. We know that it's happened. Yep. And instead of saying, oh, gee, well, you know. God, that's awful. God, yeah, that's, that's awful. terrible. And look at all the people who have suffered from this. And, you know, I, I was hoodwinked. I made a mistake. But 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 bracketing that for, for a minute, I, before I go, before I want to go on to the arts, I'm just talking to my very good friend, Andrew Doyle. Do you know Andrew Doyle? Yeah, I do. A, like Andrew, yeah. He's, yeah. Andrew's a lovely human being. He's also on your island. Also speaks fluent English. He does. He's very good at it. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. he's got a not bad brain either. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Um, and he, we're gonna, you're going to be at the Battle of Ideas. I am, yes. going to be at the Battle yeah. of Ideas. Yeah. Um, so what have, you, what have you learned from <laughs> this beside who, you, who your friend? Like, what have you learned from this? Oh, it's so ironic because, like, I was – when I was a student, I was really obsessed with uh, Weimar Germany and the kind of the spread of uh, Nazism. And my favorite choreographers were were women, some of whom were, were murdered by the Nazis, some of whom actually capitulated. And I was absolutely fascinated by this era and what happened. I then lived in Poland. I lived in Germany. I'd long, long thought, you know, what is that question? What would you do? What would you do? My family background is Polish as well. So, so I heard at the dinner table how my family survived Nazism and then survived communism. Um, and then here we here we are. Here we are. This is what this is what's happening. And so th there was a point, it was very existential, and it was kind of like, I know I still want to dance. I want to still be Rosie Kay. I don't want to have my soul broken by this. I don't want to capitulate. I'm just going to say, well, I knew I could never work with any of you ever again. Goodbye. Shut down. I'm off over here. Now, they then tortured me for another year and a half by making my very well financially solvent company insolvent. Yeah. And I had to fight them with a whole team of different lawyers. Can I say uh, may I also add to my prediction and say that the very people who did that will absolutely positively and unequivocally, and I will take you out to an incredibly nice dinner if I'm wrong, and your husband and your kids, they will never apologize to you. No. That is my prediction. Yeah, you. I don't never. think they can. I ended up having to buy my name back. Right. So that only got sorted April this year. So so they were they were like trying to destroy me. Right. And, and so and so it's like what what you're asking it's like it's like on the one hand it did feel like some type of destruction yeah. on the other i i was not going to be beaten it, and i don't know what that means for my life going forward because actually all i want to do is make dance that's harder and harder but if this is where i am this is where i am i i'm not i'm not going mad about lying to myself right and think about how crazy it is what this is over this is over there pretending. Yes. They are pretending to not know something everybody knows. That's right. And it, and that seems to me like a real insult to the arts as well, to like my art form. Like I said, like we, we deal with bodies. It feels like a real, I mean, you talk about gaslighting. It's such an overused word now, but like, come on, these are bodies. We, we, we're experts. Well, I know. Again, I, I say this facetiously, but somewhat seriously, maybe we really actually, there is a use for Hamas. We get these people in and we want to know what a woman is. We just ask these people because we have so many people at this point pretending to not know things that they know that literally everybody knows and everybody has known for millennia, not even centuries. And so the fact that they go after their ideological enemies, think about the people they go after. They go after people who are generally successful and they go after people who do not pretend to know things that they do not know. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's, it's also an integrity test, isn't it? It's a sort of like, okay, let's like, let, okay, you've got to say the sky is green, and everybody that says, well, no, actually, it's blue today. Right, okay, now we know who the difficult ones are. Get out. Right. You know, that's it. And now we've got a we've we've got a more compliant population. And anyone that was going to say the sky is green, they're going to shut up because we've just tortured this person over here. Okay, so let's. So I'm I'm curious about the arts, and uh, I've just been getting into theater. Reed and I are going to theater. Saturday night, then I'm very excited about that. But let me ask you, what, so what's happening to the arts here on the island? Uh, so we, we've got um, two, two parts of the arts. You have a kind of more commercial sector, which is maybe more musicals based, and you have a subsidized sector. So we have something called the Arts Council, which funds almost just, just under a billion pounds worth of arts per annum. Um, and that sector includes theater, dance, visual arts, uh, museums and galleries and music, particularly classical music and jazz music rather than commercial music world. Yeah. So I'm from that kind of arts council subsidized world. So that's kind of seen as the elite. Um, everything from the Royal Opera House to your local arts center probably has some level of sort of subsidy. Now that's the world that's been particularly captured by this ideology. And there's quite a long, long route as to why that's happened which I don't mind explaining. Yeah, but, uh, g give us... G g so I suppose going back like 20, 30 years, there was instrumentalism in the arts. Explain it to me like I'm five. So so in order to kind of like keep funding the arts, Thatcher said, well, the arts have to do something to society. So, you, so we'll only give you funding if you help deprive children. So that's instrumentalism in its sort of very simple terms. Blair government came in they started subsidizing arts um, in a much bigger way and saw it as the vehicle of regeneration. So it's fabulous. I kind of came back to the country at this time, big new art centers going up everywhere like Gateshead, uh, revitalizing, using arts to make areas cool and funky, lots of money going in. So alongside that kind of subsidized world, there's also the academic world of the arts and, and they didn't meet. Academic sort of like arts degrees just ballooned in the sort of like from 2010, well, earlier than that, sort of 20, 2006 onwards. They were never going to be on stage and performing like those of us that went to conservatoires. But they kind of built and grew in size. These are people only maybe getting four hours training a week, uh, learning postmodernist sort of theory, but only sort of performing to one another, really. Now, that's the sector that seems to have come through because these are people that have not got the technical discipline. Probably in my profession would get injuries really too easily. Probably feel insecure about the fact that they haven't got terribly great technique, but think they're superior because they've got all the postmodern deconstructive, deconstructivism sort of intellectual frameworks. So you're no longer just being an expert in the arts. You're deconstructing whatever that is. So that gave a fertile ground for then these sort of movements to come in. You've got a kind of like just a lack of respect to training, lack of respect to expertise and a sense of like we kind of we want to destroy everything, really. And now the state of the arts in a nutshell is what? Um, I just interviewed someone who described it as a culture of fear and loathing. So everyone's afraid, nobody wants to speak out, everyone's afraid that they'll be targeted, and if they're targeted, they'll get hounded out of their jobs, out of their livelihoods. And there's a loathing because people loathe that atmosphere. It's not the arts world I worked in for the majority of my career. It's not the best way to create art. Um, but there's also a sense that if you do have the wrong views, as in the kind of the, the 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 heterodox views um you will you will be loathed by this big mass of people so i'm just going to throw this out there was it fair to say that that's the problem of the arts because the arts are only as good as the people in it well i think it's it, it's it's deeper than that like in, in order to make really great art you've got to kind of play with the heights and depths of humanity. Um, you've got to be able to say the wrong thing. You've got to be able to joke. You've got to be able to play. And if you're already coming into the studio already with like your identity and your views 
and your positions intact, then, then how on earth? Well, you're not an artist, are you? You're an activist. And activism is propaganda. Right. So I'm really glad you said that. So that their activism or their ideological structure overrides their their desire to be an artist and in their actual performance of their art because how can you ever really think through and be sympathetic to an unsympathetic character you know like like you you need to be able to know we've all got greatness and weakness built inside of us and the whole beauty of theater and live arts particularly is is exposing some of those contradictions that we all contain within ourselves if we all just went around being right all the time yeah. and then putting that on stage i mean we really are looking at you know communistic style propaganda well, i'm just i'm just tossing this out what do you think of the idea of i've heard this idea in terms of economic structures i've never heard it in terms of the arts but i'm borrowing from that ripe vein of literature what do you think about the idea of constructing two parallel independent art scenes one in which you can be free to express and be free to whatever kind of and the other you operate within the rigid confines of the ideology and then theater goers can decide which they <laughs> what, what do you think of that well that's that's what I, i've been thinking along those lines too because we're kind of in a little bit danger at the moment because you've got the musicals on the one hand which are making i think the money for the theaters to stay open yeah. and on the other you've got this kind of like haranguing kind of like you know pointed finger type sort of work that i mean audiences must be really turned off from yeah i, I i've been thinking like um i mean i think i was already trying to do it i started to feel the sort of chill coming in I made a work called Fantasia of Pure Dance because I was just aware that I, everything I was doing was going to be seen as political. Um, but I'm also thinking like, what kind of like Academy of the Arts would you set up to make sure that your next generation of artists weren't being trained as activists, but actually, I mean, did everything first practically and the philosophy of art and the history of art before they then start to specialize. So they get some like I was saying at the start, some biggest sense of like the depth of their their impact and their training and why be an artist? Yeah, I, I, I mean it quite literally. Like you, you'd walk into a theater and there'd be a little sticker on the side. And like, I'm, I'm not being yeah, facetious, yeah, I'm yeah, being yeah, dead serious. Yeah. And it would say like, you know, this is a whatever you want to call it, free art zone. And then this is a c critical social justice art arts yeah. zone. And then people, the theater goer could decide where they wanted to go. I mean, is would that not be, what, what do you think of that? I think that's probably slightly where we're going right now in the UK. I, I mean, the difficulty for me is there's been so few people in the arts that have spoken out publicly. So then, okay, so, so let's, I know that let's my... run with that then. So if that's the case then we would have more critical social justice art theaters and we would see, so the marketplace would decide, the people would decide, and it wouldn't be the artist, but it would be the people who go to the shows. I right. But you're missing the really vital bit, which is quite specific okay. to the UK, which is how the funders influence from top down. Uh -huh. You're thinking that this is sort of audience bottom up. A lot of these people don't care if there's an audience or not. Truly, they don't care. Now, the Arts Council has been funding this type of work, the, what you would call the social justice kind of work, steadily more and more and more and more and more. I mean, I think Kathleen Stock did a fantastic un article in Unheard. Right, right. Just, just Google the number of queer works in the application. That was a great article. That's a great article. Kathleen Stock, Unheard, read. Can we pull that up? And, and so that's the work that's getting funded. And so the whole funding system is skewering artists. Artists are going to go towards where the money is, sure. especially if they're not being judged on their audience figures particularly. So the more that they put in queer, the more that they'll get the funding, the more that they get the funding, the more work's going to be out there. And just, just to be crystal clear, Kathleen Stock is gay. So it's not like she's some kind of anti. <laughs> 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 right? No, yeah, we've, no we've, I love we've Kathleen. Be, we, we've become close. She, she, she's a wonderful person. Okay, so I guess if that's the case, then... Either the if you want to maintain that pre-existing ideological capture, then you'd keep the status quo. But if you want to somehow, to borrow a turn of phrase, disrupt it, 
then you'd have to vote in a, a government and particularly elected leader who would ch change the funding structure, eliminate the funding structure, because I was thinking about it from more of an American perspective. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, so I'm just setting up an organization to help protect the arts and protect artists. And one of the things like, so, so, you know, this is like the question that you often ask. It's like, how much do we hold on to the institutions we've got and try and help them improve? And how much do we start from scratch again? And at the moment, I am still fighting to try and point out to institutions that their duty of impartiality is written within their frameworks and they ca and they cannot be biased towards uh. um, one protected characteristic of the equality law and not the other. And we take them to court and we win. The, the only reason one would buy into that though is if one already bought into that. <laughs> but that's probably where I still am slightly. Right. I, I, I still, you know, there's still a little vestige of like, you know, trust in the system to go like, hang on guys, like be the adults in the room. And there are no adults in the room and the system is completely corrupt. And I'm not sure that we're going to have any kind of government that's going to come in and sort sort this out. I might know a couple of politicians that might actually understand the situation or understand the situation in the arts. Yeah. But you're right, it's it's infiltrated everything from the military to the NHS to... The CIA, to, we saw a clip yesterday. Oh, a civil service. It, it's funny how public institutions, I'm speaking more in the U United States, I'm just learning about your people and... Your uh, customs, customs. yes your traditions although the tea is pretty good huh <laughs> just learning about that uh it, it's funny how long-standing venerable institutions have squandered hard-earned trust yeah yeah it's, it's it, funny I say, how I say funny to be to put a little levity into it but i i do you have a solution to that i've got a theory about it which is that i mean i'm of the really difficult generation x and we were the generation that sort of constantly wanted to be grown up from the minute they were, I mean, I'm, you know, talking about dancing. I was traveling across Devon in three, on three buses at the age of 10, you know, like we were always grown up too, too early, desperate to prove ourselves and, and wanted positions of authority kind of quite young, of which the boomer generation absolutely hated us and saw us as competition and didn't mentor us in the way that previous generations had. So I think the boomer generation, and, and we're literally talking about like their kids. Yeah, yeah. So the 20 to sort of 30 year olds, millennials. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're their little foot soldiers that mean that they, they, they're going to like, they're squandering all the freedoms that they've been given on a plate, but they're going to uphold yeah. the boomers kind of like, hold of their like their their stranglehold yeah i i want uh, i wonder and let me know if you think this is related or not so i've i've heard the argument so i'm going to go back to something you said and then i'm going to jump forward again i've heard the argument that we have to have no categories of of uh sex and sports we just have to let anybody who wants to, we just open it up open which is men's uh, is open anyway isn't it actually M men I think men's is, is actually open yeah, anyway, there's a reason and, that, that, and that's why. Well, there's a reason why women's sport only sort of. I mean, there was women's sports. I think in the twenties, like there was women's football, and then they shut it down because it was too popular, and it took until the seventies and eighties for women actually to get their own categorization in sports. So we haven't had it for long in sports. Okay, so if we just op we had one category and everybody went in there, and as expected, men would dominate most physical sports. Uh, we'll bracket for, for now, but there's actually been talk of why chess. Uh, yeah, that's it, right. But we can, we can come yeah, back to yeah. that if you want. Um, yes, I'm also really interested in the military as well. I'm kind of thinking, because I've worked a lot with the army over 15 years, so that like how women really change the makeup of, of a fighting force. And, and I'm really starting to think like changing my ideas around that as well. Okay, so okay, so let's so if we we open that up, and as expected, biological natal males would dominate that. I, I'm I'm just thinking out loud here, so this might not work at all. But what if you just opened up in a kind of a 
similar way, vaguely. Maybe my maybe this the segue is breaking down, but that that the most deranged critical social justice propositions, you know, and, and that that this the billion dollar funding put on, you know, for example, the glorification of Hamas or something like that. I mean, the, the here's the parallel. The parallel being that. In the same way that many people have advocated that we open up categories so that we can see definitively that NATO males consistently win, when you really let people know what this is about, which I've been sc I mean, I'm screaming about literally for over a decade now, and only now are people like, oh, geez, maybe it might be there, it might be anti-Semitic or, or what have you. Yeah. Jew, Jew hatred is a is a most precise phrase. I, I wonder if. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm struggling here, but if you let the people who are controlling the funding put on any kind of presentations they want and just capitulate to it, I'm wondering if the advantage of that wouldn't be that the theater goers and people would see actually what they believe. Does that make sense? Like operation, let them speak kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what like yeah. sex matters use like my my own Helen Joyce kind of use like just let them talk and it kind of it peaks a lot of people. Yeah, and you'd take that same principle and you'd you'd embed it in the theater scene. I, or is that just a horrible the, the, idea? The problem is the problem is 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 theater is a kind of um, like you only learn by doing it, and you only learn through like making your own shows and making your own ex uh, sort of mistakes. And when you kind of absolutely flood that with only one ideology, that by its very definition is going to cut out a huge other swathe of talent if they don't subscribe to that ideology or if they don't publicly subscribe to that ideology. So I, I just worry that in terms of like the arts isn't as a isn't as much of a free market as you think it is. Yeah. Okay. I'm. You're right. And I wonder if the pri again. I'm just throwing this out there, this is going to be a horrible thing to say to you, but I wonder if the price of letting people see that what these people believe is the death of the arts. So we, oh. give them, we give them what they want. You want to defund the police? Let's defund the police. Let's have them destroy an entire city. Let's have rapists and maniacs murder and just go on a complete rampage while we send the social workers out and they're beheaded and murdered and rampaged. Like, why not just give them what they want? Because when, I mean, I think you're right. I, I mean, I, I do feel like some of these arguments, they're not just an attack on your individual soul. There's there's an attack on the soul of, of the arts, of, of, of beauty, of, of, of truth, of like, you know, the search for that. They believe beauty is subjective. They're not, they believe it's a, the it's truth oppressed. is. Truth right. is oppressive. It's Tr their truth. Truth is a, truth. oppressive. Truth is uh, um, embedded in power relations. Not that there is no truth, it's more complicated, but so, so do you think that the problem with giving them what they want in the arts is that fewer people would go into the arts and it would ultimately destroy the arts? If you believe that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, if you believe that, then do you also believe it's not worth the price? Because we're fighting now, it seems that you're fighting, and you're not doing anything. It's and I don't mean it pejoratively. I mean like, it's not the fight that you're having is not successful because the same people with the purse strings are still funding critical social justice theater. Yeah, and you've also then got you know these people saying, "Oh, but look at AI. AI is going to come in," and and of course you've got to say, "Well, no, hang on. You you just need to have an expert eye, whether you be a cartoonist or a writer or a choreographer like me, and you just look at what I AI make and you say, no, 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 no. The quality of that is only as good as the quality that's put in, and the quality's rubbish to anyone with an expert eye." But I'm already a I'm already a, a serious like sort of older generation that that was taught by the experts and they've shared my expertise you know you only takes one generation like a cultural revolution yeah and you cut out that entire learning to learning peer peer learning teacher to teacher relationship you lose those skills you and lose you, that expertise so i guess in a cross-cultural way you could look at it as a kind of maoism a kind of complete destruction of cultural norms burning and destruction of books yeah look at what and you does, don't think it's worth it uh, to just cede to them 
seed whole cities, abolish the prisons, seed believe all women, just seed everything to them. And then let them live in the filth of the society that they have created and doomed us all to live in. No, like because it's because huge... but there's there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere for us to, us to escape to. I mean, we you mean can't... on the island or in general? In, in general, where where could you go? There's nowhere to go. So we have to do our best. Uh, I have a child. Um, he absolutely loves the arts and music and these sorts of and great films and cinema. And he can tell the difference between a crappy CGI film and a really really beautiful cartoon. I think the I think human nature. I don't want to lose seventy years in order to kind of get artistic creation back. I think we've got to fight it tooth and nail. Yeah. So let let let. So what is what does winning look like? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's like back to where we were. Yeah, that's the question. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. I think we have to kind of. I mean, it would be good if we could at least talk about it. That would be really, that would be really great if we could just have some conversations and talk about it. I mean, at the moment, we're still in the sort of, we're still slightly in the no debate in the arts. No debate in the arts. Yeah. Which is I like, guess, you know, yeah. where it's meant to be, yeah. actually. I, I guess the thing that's interesting about that is I don't, and again, I'm not coming from this from the arts. Like, I'm not shocked by that but i am surprised yeah what i'm shocked by is the no debate in philosophy no yes. debate in the academy yes no debate among people who pride themselves in whether or not you want to say it's in a socratic tradition no debate among them that's antithetical to the very principles under which they at least until very recently uh, espoused so i guess no debate in the arts I, like when I think of the arts, I don't think of like a debating society or debating. I, I think of like performers. Again, I'm just a layman. I'm not. So so I, I had a really interesting year. Um, I was an artist in residence at the University of Oxford um, at the School of Anthropology. And I had this sort of like fantastic year, uh, you know, going to lectures and thinking, wow, you know, I, lo I love this kind of like taste of academia. But as soon as I started like asking questions about things that they didn't like, I realized that it wasn't this open, free, anthropological, let's look at modern tribes world at all. Because I started looking really seriously at conspiracy theory. And I was going, well, where, is, where are your experts? Anti-racism, all of anti-racism is one giant conspiracy theory. The whole thing is a conspiracy theory. And, and I was told it's career suicide. If you even talk about conspiracy theory, and this was like back in 2014, right. if you even talk about conspiracy theory, Rosie, you, you, right. it's career suicide. I said, well, I don't care. I'm an artist. I'm going right. to just follow what I want to do. And of course it turns out, well, that's that's all just, we're talking just, about now. Ju just the idea that there are these invisible forces of oppression in, in in which they only oppress certain people and not oppress other people, and we change the meaning of you know, person of color or what have you. Just the idea that there's this uh, uh, Wilford Riley, a, my, a buddy of mine, put out a great tweet that I retweeted about this or X or I don't even know what it's what is it called? Retweet X, whatever it's called. Rex. Post a, a great, <laughs> a great post. Um and and one of my favorite phrases is from also from the island, Helen Pluckrose. Yeah, uh, it's a conspiracy without any conspirators. I mean, this this whole we've been asked to accept truly the most astonishing conspiracy theory that systems are responsible for every disparity that everybody's. For, I mean, the the number of thing, the number of beliefs that you would have to accept that are antecedents to those prior to those in order for you to accept something so just utterly demonstrably false. And then I think to myself, wow, either people actually believe this or they pretend to believe this. And then I think like, so I talk to you or I talk to Andrew Doyle or I talk to other people I've, I've been speaking about. I was actually on, on, on her today for lunch. I had a good conversation about this is that I, I am, I am flabbergasted by the, complete ideological penetration of there's no there's no other something so untethered and unhinged from reality and how many smart people are pretending to believe this and the thing the thing i think where we need to take this conversation now is like what do we do about it yeah. like what practical steps do we take we, we i think we both agree it's not good no nope. I don't. I see certain facets of this as getting better in terms of the ideology is being pushed slowly into ill repute. But it's 
large swaths of the society are completely more than large swaths are completely captured by it. So what do we what do we do about the ideology and the arts? What do we do about oh, it? Oh, it's it's really hard because I uh, uh, that piece we started with MK Ultra is particularly um, so based on real brainwashing programs, and I think my whole process was was that I have this fear that we're walking we're sleepwalking into a mass brainwashing and here we are yeah, yeah. now to to deprogram someone I've worked with sort of people that were specialists in cults to deprogram someone is really really difficult and you can't work on the conscious brain you can't work with logic and you can't work with rationale the way they described it and the way that I'll try and explain it as simply as possible because I'm not saying that I understand this deeply yeah. is that you need to sew a question that's so deep and so profound and so true, like it's a good question, that their subconscious brain will not let it go. And so they will carry on sometimes for maybe six months, maybe a year, yeah. but their subconscious is working. And at one point they'll suddenly just wake up from it and they'll go, hang on, I know what a man and a woman is. I know. So so on the one hand, I think there's well, mass, hopeful. mass deprogramming that needs to happen. And, the, and then my other... Is, is, is the old-fashioned ways, the lawfare, the taking people to court, the shaming them, the kind of public outcries about stuff, getting more people to speak up. You know, that's the hard work stuff. That's just graft. And that's like person winning person to person to person, conversations with each person saying, I know this is scary. I know you don't want to stick your head up. But if you don't, this is where it's going. And if you do, it will really help. And we'll give you cover here. And these are these other people. And we can all join together. Because lots of people are feeling very lonely and isolated by this situation. And as long as, like, you kind of keep speaking out and say, you know, come to me. And I'm not going to – and I'm going to – it's a big, broad church. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to have any ideological positions but a position of freedom, you know. And, and hopefully that's a good message that gets out. So I guess here's what I struggle with. I struggle with the fact that that the people at the most egregious examples, the execrable, truly ghastly treatment of young kids who are confused about gender, the butchers who did surgical procedures upon them, they will get off scot-free. The hospital administrators who assisted in this will get off scot-free. The people who actively, intentionally, willfully, deliberately destroyed people's lives for long periods of time, they will get off scot-free. Everybody has a built-in get-out-of-jail card who has worked to actively undermine democratic institutions, to destroy people's lives, to mutilate children's genitals all of these people are getting off scot-free all of them all of them i know and i struggle with that i'm not saying i have an answer to that but it's so yeah, i struggle with it too it's not right it's not right and i guess you know in in a medical context the mantra would be something like, oh, we offered the best care. Or we we looked at the at the data from the best available peer review. And there'd be some truth to that. Of course, the journals themselves are captured. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I do wonder, Michael Schellenberger and I just put, I just talked about this yesterday, the uh, mapping onto the DSM cluster B personality, yep. nar narcissism and, and other personality disorders onto participants of the ideology. Um, so, so yeah, so I struggle with that. And I also go between, it's, it's hard to know, like, so since I, I'm very hopeful and sometimes I'm not hopeful, <laughs> but I think a lot of that is the world context, like this whole Gaza thing. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I think, okay, I, I used to say to myself, like what, what would happen to people if something real actually happened? Mm -hmm. You know, like if, and, and the same people who are screaming about microaggressions and trigger warnings and safe spaces, when, when they're a student, and just to be crystal clear, like crystal clear, this is not about Israel. This is not about Palestine. This is not about Hamas. This is about rabid, foaming at the mouth, Jew hatred. Uh, and I'm not Jewish myself. When, when 
you see videos of people chanting, you know, kill the Jews. I saw it in the schools uh, uh, on X uh, today. Yeah. Uh, the same people who were freaking out about trigger warnings or someone's misgendered. My buddy Gad Sad put a, a tweet about this. They do literally nothing about this. They're yeah. just screaming for the death of Jews, literally screaming for the death of Jews and the same people, nothing. And so I think, I think in one sense, it's like the world situation is just not looking pretty good right now. And that colors things for me in one sense. And so I would love to have something. That's why I'm, I mean, I'm an atheist, but I would think that if one were a Christian, like yeah. you could have something to fall back on. Like you could say, well, you know, Jesus loves me and I'm going to, be with heavenly father forever. Like there'd be kind of a, a solace in that. But if you don't buy into that metaphysic and if you don't buy into that, then you need to look for naturalistic phenomena to things. And it's all been corrupted. The peer reviewed system is corrupt. It's, it's all yeah, corrupt. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so like, and, and, you know, I don't want to go into too, too much of a diatribe about, you know, $33 trillion in debt, printing money, you, you, you know, so, so, so there's all these other problems that are then col coloring. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so as much as I want to be optimistic, I don't find a lot of optimism. I, I find my, I find my perception of when I have conversations with you or at Unheard today about what's happening in the arts, it, it's pretty bleak. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's it's horrible to sort of feel it inside yourself as well. Like, uh, what I, I what's the point on about trying to make beautiful dance right now? You know, like like what's that going to do? How's that going to change the world? But of course, because it does. Because like for every single one of us that does keep our spirit inside, that yeah. does kind of stay true, that will insist on speaking the truth as much as they possibly can, will admit when they get it wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. will not become a victim of dogma. Like I can't stand dogma on anything, whether it be yoga dogma or political dogma, I can't stand it. Yeah, yeah. Like to stay well-trained, but flexible in your mind and in your body to stay there. Like every single person that does that is an act of, of sort of like rebellion in itself. And, and I think that's the difficulty is that we are having to hold on to ourselves and, dis and be disciplined as, as much and, and, and not get angry, not get rant, yeah, not yeah. start swearing on, on X, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like they just go, hmm, okay, that's interesting. I, you know, how do I defeat that mentality rather than just rampaging as well? You know, you can't fight like with like. You, you I, have yeah, to do no, it a different right. way. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I, guess, I, I guess in a sense I wonder like, okay, so – Let's say that we had some legal method of imprisoning these butchers who did this to kids. What does that do? I mean, the kids it, it, are already, it, it, it makes they can't an have an it orgasm. Makes, they it makes can't an have example, children. doesn't it? They it makes can't. an example. Like, 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 like much as like anyone who's cancelled becomes an example to everyone else. You, you have to put these people in prison. Whether I mean, I mean for me, it, it just feels like a mass corruption. Oh, really it's mass epic corruption. corruption of moral, unprecedented, of, 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 and, unprecedented. And, and, and on one hand, they're all fuck the Tories with the PPE, but on the other, you have these doctors that, that, are, that are doing things that are wrong. You know, it, it's a mass corruption, and you actually have to start to make examples. You have to, you have to clean it up. You have to, you have to sort of put some of these people in prison. You may not be able to put all of them in, but, but I think that's, that's what cleaning up does. Yeah. As a, a friend of mine uh, has this, um, he he advocates this thing that I find is so interesting: experience near versus experience far. So experience near is things in your life, things that you can do something about, like you know, eating well, sleeping, just you know, your relationships, yeah. your kid, your you know, your son. And experience far is things neither one of us could literally. There's literally nothing I can do about Hamas, like just nothing, like absolutely. We can't do anything about Hamas. I can't do anything about you know, Chinese takeover of Taiwan. I can't do anything about it. I can't. So what, so I, so sometimes I wonder like, okay, so maybe the focus should be, we should, we should at least dedicate, I guess the question is what percentage of time should be dedicated to experience yeah. here versus experience. Yeah, no, far, I know right? exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so I'm a big, big fan of developing 
like to get your perspective on this. I'm a big, big fan of developing a physical excellence. Yeah. I think it's extremely important to develop some physical excellence. I, I guess deep down, I do think there's somewhat of a hierarchy, but as long as it's, you know, you, you've, you've, it goes back to kind of a Greek, the Greek conception of a kind of, of, of a physical virtue. That's why I was curious before about, if you'd rewind the tape, if you'd still do dancing, um, that's why I was curious about that. You know, Reed is just beginning his jujitsu journey. But 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 the, but there's very few physical disciplines that combine the body, mind, and the soul, and the only one that does is dance properly. On its own, okay, you have so nothing else. You have no other. Explain, you have no explain, instrument. Explain, explain to me because. Explain to me because I'm not I'm not seeing that. You're not seeing it. You haven't or you haven't experienced it yourself. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm trying to get a physical excellence myself, but I've not but, seen it. But when it you dance. but that's a kind of that's like kind of like that's for me like my warm up. I don't know. Yeah, you, you have your your discipline, you learn yeah. it, you you get better, you get worse. That's just the starting point. That's just like the first two hours okay. of your morning. Okay. Then you have the intellectual problem which you kind of pose to yourself. What is this intellectual problem I'm trying to solve through the medium of dance? And then you have the emotional world that is very hard to express. Sometimes it's beautiful through poetry or through music, but dance has a particular beauty because actually we are physical creatures and we read the tiniest imperceptional kind of movements, tilts of head, closeness, awareness. Oh, interesting. So you're playing both with sort of three-dimensional mathematics, physics, dealing with like one body in space, two bodies in space, lifts, like like actual yeah, yeah, yeah. Ge geometry in human form with levers and forces. And then of course you have a huge emotional context. What does this actually read? How do humans read this? And then you have the wonder of, 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 of music or, or atmosphere or theatrics that put something entirely different. So you could have the, the most beautiful tender duet with the most harsh music and suddenly it looks like something entirely different. You see what I mean? So, so, so your starting point of the physical discipline is literally just being able to have the language to then start your day's work. Okay, so I'm going to push back on that a little bit. <laughs> so I guess the thing with me is that that I think, when I think of dance, I'm I'm a huge fan of corrective mechanisms. Like, I'm a huge fan that I think, when I think of a corrective mechanism, say, okay, someone's dancing and they fall. So gravity, et cetera, was a correct, it corrected them. And so that, you know, they didn't just f float away. Like I don't <laughs> see dance as having the same corrective mechanisms as say basketball, like active. I don't understand that at all, but we deal with falling all the time. Like, like no, that's I know. what you so learn I'm from when you're. That yeah, no. S from your tiny and you're growing up and becoming no, a dancer. No, that, and... So the falling is the correct. mechanism. don't want to mechanism. do it on stage. No, no. The falling is the corrective mechanism on dance. But the whole thing isn't like jujitsu or boxing or skiing. Skiing would be a good example. The whole thing is a corrective mechanism, like all of it, downhill skiing. Like there's, it's constant like micro adjustments. And you don't think dance is the same? Like, like if you, you, you never do, you have a really, really, really difficult duet where like you're lifting each other. It's never yeah, the same the twice. Be, the duet would be the. You'd never right. dance at the same twice ever. And no theater is the same. Every floor is different. Every light is different. Every audience member is different. Every audience yeah. member gives you something different. You know, it's you rehearse, 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 rehearse to, so that you can do it. Absolutely, like like without having to really think about it, you get on stage and it's just like everything's out the window. It's a complete nightmare. So it's like there's the pleasure of the audience and the intellectual stimulation of the audience. So if, if it's boring, it fails. And if it's ugly, it fails. Not if that's what you're trying to do. I mean, in my art form and contemporary dance, ugliness might be your aim. It's more like contemporary art than sort of classical art I suppose it's like we're, we're we can play with what we want what the body can give us yeah. what it can show on stage you can I can I love to show ugliness now and again it's gorgeous you know there's something really interesting about that I just saw Fiddler on the Roof in Vienna uh -huh. and I um befriended I went to the, the one of the actors houses who was wonderful with his wife and uh remarkable 
r remarkable performance. And I, because I, I'm just learning about the theater now. So I'm kind of, is there a, a, a booming theater a scene where you, where you live in Birmingham? Yeah. <laughs> I have a complicated relationship with Birmingham right oh, now. Okay. Yeah, because I, um, I was very close to um, several big theatres and um, I don't know why, but I can't seem to get my work put on after 20 oh, years. Well, of, there you go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a little bit painful, but yeah, I mean, it, it should do, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I asked the, uh, the conductor of the fid Fiddle on the Roof, I said, if I went up there as an actor and tried to pretend to conduct how long would it take everybody to know before I was a, a fraud? Like a millisecond. An That's what he said. He said one note. Of course. One yeah. note. Yeah. And I was, wow. That's pretty crazy to me. But that's what one, I love. That's one what I, note. Wow. But that's what I love about my art form. It's like it's 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 really egalitarian because it's 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 working, you know, talent out. You you can't fake it. Yeah. You can't fake it, and 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 anyone can. I can see it. Okay. All right. Well, hold on a second. If you can't fake it, then every single person would automatically know what good choreography was. I know bad. that's different. Choreography is difficult. Oh, you mean you can't? You can't fake being a good dancer or not. You see a lot of bad dancers out there. I mean, that's what the whole sort of postmodernism sort of allowed was that is that, you know, yeah. anyone can dance. And, and I, you know, I, I subscribe to some of that. You know, I mean, like five minutes ago, I, I'd be sort of, you know, yeah, everyone can dance. And, you know, like I've done you know, mountains of community work. I've been an expert in community work. But it's nothing without the expertise. It can't replace the expertise. Yeah, yeah. Expertise is fascinating, you know. I, I, so you can have, it, if you gave me a flute, I did not play the flute, you would know in one note, that I do not and I play the flute. Yeah. Uh, my son's learning the clarinet. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, I used to play yeah. the clarinet. I, I never liked it, but my, my father in particular, I tried the violin too. He thought it was very important for me to, and the piano, to learn I a musical the instrument. Piano. But I, I rebelled and fought against it every step of the way. I just, and, and I have a, a buddy of mine, I'm not going to mention him, but he's a well-known public intellectual. We were staying at a friend of mine's house. He's incredibly talented musician you're gonna watch what i say because i don't want anybody to pick up who this is uh and 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 he said i said something like oh you know i don't i don't play and he said he said something like oh you know it's, it's really too bad and i thought to myself like I don't, is it i don't know because i've tr i've made specific deliberate life choices to choose other things that's why it's interesting to me when i hear you clearly have a passion for dance that so you see something in dance that I don't see, but I would like to see. Like, I would like to see what you see so I would get an appreciation of the thing that you see. Exactly. And then, I mean, I was lucky enough to do some work with neuroscientists to try and test that. Like, what is it that audiences are seeing? Yeah. And um, we, we, I choreographed this piece that uh, it was to Bach in silence with really strong breath. And with electronic music, and the the two most important ones was the same. It's exactly the same piece of choreography, yeah. And we rehearsed it to a, a beat track, so we didn't try and dance it differently. Once to the bar, and once to the to the breath, and then we did audience research with real life people, and then we put people through fMRI scanners to see how they watched it, um, oh, watching their brains. Fascinating. And so the really interesting research is that. Um, and this corresponds between the fMRI and the real audience research people speaking. People loved watching the dance with the classical music because they said it made patterns. And we're like pattern recognition sort right, of right. machines, aren't we, all our brains? And it does, it lights up this bit that's kind of linked to maths, to pattern recognition. Um, and people get pleasure. They actually get a tangible pleasure. Exact same piece of dance, no music, just breath. So we're sort of exaggerating breath a little bit. Lights up completely different part of the brain. And people said they either loved it because yeah. it made it feel really raw and yeah. human and they yeah. saw the effort, or they hated it because it felt really raw and human right, and they felt the effort. And the bit of the brain that lights up is the bit that's related to your gut reaction so it actually physically communicates with you in a different way. It's fascinating. So when I make a work, I try and blend a mixture of these kind of uh, sort of techniques, I suppose, in my choreography, because I know that that audience, they're going to have different reactions to the same thing in their brains. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So in a similar way, 
that you've told me about dance and that it's not really on my radar, you know, is there anything, and I guess maybe this is a tricky question because if it's not on your radar, you're not on your radar, but would you like to learn about something that you don't know about now? Like, would you like to be introduced to something that you've maybe have a hint of a curiosity about like a whiff of curiosity? Well, I mean, I'm really, really lucky with the job I've done because my artistic sort of like instinct has taken me to like being embedded with the British army right, right. and training, like learning how to fight and, and, and doing, I mean, that was the most terrifyingly weird experience probably of my with life. With a gun, you picked up a gun. Yeah. Learned shoot, shoot uh, SAAT, got very good at it, joined a mock battle against it. I, I played an insurgent in a mock battle against a rival battalion for three days uh, in an all male infantry. So it, that was a bit mad. Uh, you... <laughs> and and so like if, if there is something that I want to look at, what what's sort of heartbreaking is that I always was able to use my art form to do that. I think the worst thing about this whole cancellation thing is they they want to take away the thing that they know you love the most. Right. That's and there's nothing more torturous. You look at the artists of like the Soviet Revolution and you can see why certain artists didn't say anything because they knew that if they lost their art, they were nothing. They were nobody. Yeah. And I don't want that to happen to me, but it's bloody terrifying because I've used my art form to let me explore the world, let the whole world and look at it and explore it and see if I can make a dance about it. I mean, it's almost yeah, but I mean, it's they don't ridiculous. Want, they don't want you to explore the world because they're convinced they have the right answers to moral questions. So what, what you said your exploration think, is a heresy. And I don't think, they are exploring the world. They're well, not. They're scared. They're, not the world. They're, they're not entrepreneurial. Right. They're not brave. They're not making their own things. They're not they're, into the meritocracy. They don't seem to think that they can start their own things. They're not doing anything. Yeah, yeah. They're not. They're not collaborative. They're not having fun. They're not having sex. They're not drinking. You know, bloody hell, that's grim. There's a lot of sex and drinking and dance. <laughs> I got to get Reed involved in that. <laughs> Well, we used to have great party. I mean, you should see a bunch of dancers on a dance floor. <laughs> really? Wow, that's in the good old days, wow. like you know, two minutes ago. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> um, is there anything I should I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Um, anything you want to talk about? Anything else that's on your mind? Well, I mean, I mean, I hope this next generation, you know, the one after this one. Just reject all of it. I think little signs of that are coming. They don't. They 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 know fine well what's male, what's female. I think you know that that would be the other green shoots. And it's not necessarily what I want to talk about, but just like I kind of want to. I want. I want to know and feel that there's hope. I think. I think. I think there's hope. I don't want to be Pollyanna about it. I, I, I think there's hope. I also think that you have to make your own hope. Yeah. You can't just hope for hope. I no. guess you could hope for hope, but it's not as productive as actually trying to do something to move the needle, to yield a kind of outcome that you want to see. That's right. That's right. That's right. And that's not just a sort of enlightenment western capitalistic concept that that actually is true that we have we have a huge we actually have the power of will our own will and individuals can make huge difference yeah. and and i think we'll get we're so ground down a little bit at the moment and that feels quite hopeless but actually you've just got to keep being brave would you let me know if you think that there are some dance performances i'm reading out here for another month uh would you let me know if you think there's like one in particular that you think I, I should see yeah sure or that we can we can he head to there's still some so there's still some good work out there yeah 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 i think i think we'd like to do that we're, we're learning about this now we're taking advantage of all the island has to offer um so it's good okay cool uh where, where can people find you your work um, I'm on wwk a 2 <laughs> k 2 com um, and I'm on Twitter, Rosie K, K2Co, so, um, and Facebook and Instagram, things like that. So Rosie K, K2Co, that's the name of my dance company, and we're touring next year. Oh. So, 
in here on the island? Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. We're touring Fantasia, which is this oh. work about supposedly truth and beauty. This is me trying to like look at the most unfashionable stuff. And then also my solo called Adult Female Dancer, which is <laughs> my one and only, yeah, one and only autobiographical solo um, of which I probably, you know, gave signs that I might be gender critical. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, I really appreciate you coming down here to talk to us and thanks for everything. Thank thanks you. For, thanks, thanks very much. Big admire of your work. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.